Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, weddings, yes. Let's talk about weddings. My parents were married in 1954, and their wedding reception, with no chicken dance, by the way, <laughs> uh, took place in the church basement, and there was coffee, and there was punch, and there was cake. Now, weddings are huge business, right? Tens of thousands of dollars are spent, not just for the reception and the dress, but for the grooms and the bridesmaids to get together all over the country and have a weekend together. Weddings. Um, also, as Pastor Gretchen said, over the years as a pastor, you do all kinds of weddings, right? I've done cowboy weddings where the party came in on horses. I've done backyard weddings. I've done destination weddings. I've done weddings on the tide flats. I've done weddings on boats. I did a wedding where a bee found its way into the bride's bodice. And she tolerated it. And as she and the groom made their way down the aisle, the minute they got to the end, she told him what would happen, and he was trying to extricate it just as her new, his new father-in-law came and said, couldn't you wait just a minute? <laughs> These are the things that happen. Weddings with guitar and brass and ukulele, and one wedding where James Brown was belting out as they left, I feel good. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, so any pastor worth their salt has all kinds of wedding stories to tell because weddings, well, they can get pretty crazy. And part of that crazy is because weddings celebrate the uniting of two unique individuals into one entity forever, we hope. And by default, they unite the families of each of those unique individuals, the families that shaped them into their uniqueness. So every single wedding, in fact, I tell couples in premarital counseling, consider your relationship a cross-cultural <laughs> interaction. We just come with different tastes and personalities and cultures and values, and habits, and gender identifications, and experiences, and hopes, and dreams. And with internet dating, and increasing pluralism, these days weddings often unite people of different races, classes, languages, communities, and religions. All in this celebration we call a wedding, becoming one hopefully happy family. In biblical times, too, weddings were huge celebrations of the new alliance between different families or clans. Except love was not the glue. It was the negotiation of livestock and money and servants or slaves in exchange for a young woman and the children she would bear the work she would do, and the alliance that this marriage created. Okay, so that's what's happening in Cana. Nice. But why? Why was that important enough for Jesus to do his first miracle? And why was his first miracle, at least in John's gospel, making sure wedding guests had enough wine to drink. I mean, honestly, that seems pretty trivial, does it not? On the surface, yes. But what you need to know is that in the Bible, a wedding is almost always more than just a wedding. It starts in the wilderness. God says to the Hebrews, I've delivered you from slavery. 
you're out here in the wilderness, and every single day I provide all that you need, and I guide you. And I have done that out of compassionate mercy and love for you. And God says to these people, I want to be your God forever. And I want you to be my people forever by following these Ten Commandments or words. So it's not too much of a stretch. In fact, many parts of Scripture understand this thing that took place in the middle of nowhere as God making a vow to the Hebrews and them making a vow to God and creating a covenant, a marriage. The prophets talk about the importance of this marriage a lot. And what they usually say is, Israel, you are as unfaithful to God as an adulterous spouse. The prophet Isaiah tells Israel, you're acting like God's covenant with you is just a form of entitlement. As if it makes you special and there's nothing else you have to do. But Isaiah says, you're so wrong. God's wedded not just to you, but God has wedded God's self to all the people of the earth. And then, if you know Isaiah at all, you know that he was an incredible prophet, a poet, excuse me. And so with soaring and memorable language throughout that book, he expresses God's vision for all the world. Here's an example where he ties that vision to a feast. And weddings in biblical times weren't a ceremony and then a feast. The weddings were the feast. Here's what Isaiah says. But here on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will throw a feast for all the people of the world. A feast of the finest foods. A feast with vintage wines. A banquet with the finest wines. And here on this mountain, God will banish the pall of doom hanging over all peoples. The shadow of doom that's darkening all nations. Yes, God will swallow up death forever and will wipe every tear from all faces. God will remove every sign of disgrace from the people throughout the earth. Jesus has the same wedding feast vision for all humanity, and he kind of riffs on it like a jazz trumpeter. Again and again, he compares the kingdom of God to a wedding feast where all are welcome, nobody goes hungry, the poor and ignored of the world eat first, and everyone celebrates. More than enough for all. And in that, all are united into one family. Siblings, all. Do you start to see how these, these stories, these streams, these themes kind of build on each other so that a wedding is always more than a wedding in Scripture. Well, we will get back to Cana, but there's one more thing I'd like to do before we get there. I happened to watch a short video this week of the 1963 March on Washington. And I was touched by it. It made all those biblical, too grand to be true visions of humanity living as the one family we are more real to me. 
In the video, we see people preparing to come together. These are people of different races and classes and ages and genders, traveling overnight, many of them traveling when traveling while black wasn't a very safe thing to do. These people are leaving their work and their homes and their families to unite, however briefly, as one human family. Is it any wonder that when Dr. King looked out on the sea of people intentionally gathered to overcome divisions and become one, he spontaneously added his most famous words, I have a dream, and went on to describe the kingdom of God, the vision of Isaiah, the intention of God's vow to us, way back in the wilderness. And Martin called us and calls us to be faithful to our vows to God, to love our neighbors, whoever they may be. It's uplifting, right? But it also touched me with a bit of pain. Watching it makes me aware that now, I can't ignore the truth of the cruel chasms still dividing our nation. Didn't we think a wedding had taken place in our country between Caucasians and African Americans? I mean, I knew the marriage wasn't perfect, but I thought, generally speaking, it was going better than not, or at least better than it was before. But now, it feels to me like the wine is running out. The guests are scattering. The vows have frayed. Or maybe it's just that we can see in a searing way what large segments of our two families never wanted the marriage to take place in the first place and consistently sabotaged and demeaned it. 
And we, we who are privileged, we've been able to live in blissful ignorance of our own entitlement. Perhaps, like me, your we're doing this commitment to racial justice has been replaced with a lot more worry and weariness and wondering. Can we unite? How? Instead of coming down the home stretch, it seems we have to step a bit closer to our friends of other races and take on again and seriously the long, slow slog, praying together, how long, O Lord? Which finally brings us to Cana, where the wedding that was supposed to unite the families into one is breaking up. Why? Well, the wine that's been fueling and uniting the hope is giving out. And everybody's wondering, is the party over? Well, boy, that wasn't what I thought it would be. Guests are drifting toward the exits. And instead of coming together, spending these days getting acquainted and sharing a laugh, a story, a hope, people are scattering into the night to their separate homes. They're all saying, what happened? We thought we had a marriage here. But it sure doesn't seem like there's much to celebrate. Which is exactly why Jesus' first miracle at that wedding, that is more than a wedding, matters. The hope comes in what Jesus uses to re-energize the wedding. Water. Just plain water. Ordinary water poured into huge urns used for worship and purification. In other words, the ordinary people we saw, the ordinary stuff of our ordinary lives, our ordinary gifts and ordinary mistakes and ordinary weariness and ordinary worries and ordinary tendency to defend ourselves from one another instead of reaching out to each other as kin. Pour all that into a sacred vessel of prayer and intention. And we will be able to slake our thirst for justice and righteousness enough to keep working for that great union. That party where we all, all drink the finest wine. The best wine, wine so good, we didn't even know it could exist. Wine we drank together. This is the wine that keeps our hope alive for the fulfillment of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Where do we find the wine? Well, this morning, hermetically sealed plastic which despite the packaging connect us as one family this morning in communion did you notice the word union <laughs> in communion we will enact the coming together that God intends for the whole human family we will bring and represent different tastes and personalities and cultures and classes and values and habits and experiences and hopes and dreams all trying to be united. We will return to this wedding feast every week as a way to remember that as one of our prayers says, it's not just about what happens today. It's a foretaste of the feast to come, that vision, that dream. So, thanking God that it's not our job to create the new wine, that's Jesus' role, we remember 
our job is to bring the tap water of our ordinary lives and hearts and hopes and pour them into the urns of this worship and this community. That will keep the party, the wedding, the celebration, the vision alive and make it real. Can we come together? We can come together. Let us practice and remember and be revived in that week after week. Thanks be to God.